Hello everyone, this is Steve Marinucci, Beatles Examiner on Examiner.com, welcoming you to another another Things We Said Today, our weekly talk fest where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles. Um, before we get started, let me introduce the three co-hosts of this show that keep this thing running and moving and grooving and whatever. Anyway, starting up in the great state of Maine, we have our musicologist and man who who knows all about all kinds of music, classical, avant-garde, other, and anything else we want to ask him about, Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello there, Alan. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Hello, everyone. And going down the East Coast, we have in Connecticut, we have the host of the Beatles show, uh, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everybody. And down in Pennsylvania, the home of the newly crowned Stanley Cup champion Pittsburgh Penguins. Some That's well, right. Not right. Not right there. Yeah, they beat my San Jose Sharks. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they did. Not that, not that they really had a chance, because I thought Pittsburgh was going to win anyway. But that's besides the point. Um, Mr. Al Sussman, how you doing, Al? Hey, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And this week we have a special guest on the line with us. We're going to talk about the monkeys uh, and their beetle connections, and the man to uh, long somebody I've known for a long time. He's been a member of my Beatles message board, uh, Abbey Road uh, message board, Mr. Fred Velez. Fred, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Hi, hi guys. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone else. Hey, there. Fred. Hey, Fred. Hey, hi. It's good hey, to be fir- here. First thing, congratulations. You and your uh, your lovely lady, uh, Linda Walsh, uh, tied the knot a couple of weeks ago. Yes, we did. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate applause, that very applause. much. Applause, applause. applause, Just applause. Throw- applause, yes. applause. Just throw money. Just throw money. <laughs> just throw money. <laughs> but no, I I guess. Let, let, there's a guy out there who has two dollars that uh, he's willing to send to. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> send it to send it to the wedding re- registry. Okay. <laughs> right here we go. He'll, he'll get you a quiet you mouse. Oh, there you go. There we go. <laughs> I would imagine you use monkey songs for your wedding songs. Oh yes, we did. We started the uh, first dance with "It's Nice to Be with You." Oh. Ah, right. very nice. That, that's our that's our song. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, two weeks after the uh, the real wedding, we did we did a renewal of the vows at the Monkey Jam convention in New Jersey in the Meadowlands, in which uh, I was dressed in, monk- in Mickey's poncho tablecloth. <laughs> and we, oh my and gosh! We, and we did monkey vows, you know, using song titles and lyrics, and it was very nice. Uh, the fans enjoyed it. Very cool. Very cool. Mm. Let me start with um, it, it's it's really kind of I mean uh, I don't know about everybody else but the 50th anniversary of the monkeys just kind of crept up on me. I mean I I, I, I it, it's it's hard to believe it's been 50 years. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's it's it is hard to believe. It's like only yesterday we just saw the show for the first time. Right. I mean, how? What do you think has kept the show going so well and 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 so popular? I mean, it, it's it's really, and I've noticed this in my, you know, in the time I've been Monkeys Examiner. There's a there's a, you know, there's a there's a level of fandom with fans of the Beatles, and there's a and there's a different level of fandom with the Monkeys fans, and uh, it's really it, it's really really intense. Not to say that the Beatles. Isn't but it's there's a there's a just a different level there. What do you do? You see that too? Yes, I do. I think it's because they the the monkeys came out of two media's. They came out of television first. Uh, well, actually, well, they came out of television and records and music, but they both converged at the same. I think because you had that because it was part of the whole Beatlemania thing at the time. You know, you still had we were still riding the wave of Beatlemania. And then you had this show that was obviously based on the Beatles uh, come out with a whole different set of guys. Mm-hmm. And you got to know them, even though they're playing characters, they're basically playing themselves. And I think the fact that they played them, characters as Peter, Davey, Mickey, and Mike, uh, personalized them to the fans a lot. Because mm-hmm. remember, even when we saw the Beatles on television, Ed Sullivan and things like that, it was always in a concert thing or a brief interview thing whatever but you never really per se got to know them if you know what i mean mm-hmm. uh with, with 
the monkeys. It was like it was like a more they were in the you were, they were in your living room every week, and you really and in in some strange way you got to know them that way, and their personalities came through on the screen, so that when you when you got like interviews like out of uh, Sixteen Magazine or Tiger Beat, you got to know them a little bit more. I mean, Mickey used to have his sister Coco write columns and Tiger Beat and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that helped mm -hmm. personalize things. And even Michael Nesmith's wife Phyllis, at the uh, his late his first wife Phyllis wrote uh, some stuff uh, like fashion mm -hmm. tips and things. So it it became a more personal thing than I think the Beatles did, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, you had some incredible music, you know, with the Monkees, you know, written by, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the cream of uh, songwriting at the time, like Carol King, you had Neil Diamond, Neil Sedaka, you had Boyce and Hart, you had people like Harry Nielsen, uh, Carol Bayer Sager. David who, Gates. Uh, David Gates, Paul mm -hmm. Williams. You yeah. had incredible songwriters, and the Monkees themselves uh, individually were good songwriters. Michael Nesbitt particularly is an amazing songwriter mm -hmm. and Mickey Dolenz has shown himself his talent uh, in his songs and Peter Tork mm -hmm. as well and even Davey in the songs that he's written definitely showed talent in that uh, regard mm -hmm. you're, you're right and, and, and what's really and I don't want to get too far ahead because I was actually going to wait on talking about good times until later but I mean mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was really surprised how well good times worked I really did not expect Good times to be as good as it is, oh, and yeah. to be to go in the manner. I expect you know. I don't know about you, but I fully expected that when I heard that they were going to use modern songwriters, that we were looking at another kind of pull it, pull it mm -hmm. for those who who mm. don't know was one of the several monkeys uh, reunion it was, attempts. It was the first that, one. It was the it was the first one after the singles from 1986. Right, um, I, and. They, they tried to update the sound, and it did not work, really. Um, yeah, I, I, I got, I, can I just say, well, Heart and Soul, I thought was an amazing record. Oh, I loved Heart and Soul. Record. That was a great song. I don't it know is. why it, that song wasn't a huge hit. I could talk about MTV, but I don't know if we have enough hours in, the t in this uh, podcast. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to read my book, guys. You ch <laughs> Your book, which is called... A little bit yes. me, a little bit you, the monkeys from a fan's perspective. Uh, uh -huh. It was all about my experiences as a fan of the group from the very beginning to more recently, and not just my stories, but other fan stories too, including some from people like Dave Alexander, who's in the monkeys band, mm -hmm. and, uh, and people who've worked with them. So, um, and uh, I, I have a chapter in there regarding. The whole MTV thing. So if you guys want to read about that, it's right there in the book. <laughs> and how does okay. one get the book? Uh, the usual outlets, Amazon, uh, Apple iBooks, uh -huh. uh, Barnes & Noble, Nook, uh, Smashwords, CreateSpace. Uh, I'm there, folks. You can find me. <laughs> <laughs> go out in a buying frenzy. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I was very impressed with what they did with Good Times. I, I did not expect them to to retro to the 60s, and they, and they did a marvelous job. They did a mm -hmm. marvelous, marvelous oh, job. Oh, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to put it or, uh, turn it around the table. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Cousin, uh, why don't you take a shot? Um, about Good Times? No, about the <laughs> Well, anything you, anything you want. Yeah, the monkeys. I mean, the monkeys were. You know, I, I remember when they first came on. Um, among Beatle fans, there was a lot of suspicion um, mm -hmm. yes. because it seemed to be. You know, they were saying prefab four, and um, mm -hmm. it seemed to be kind of. You know, and plus, <laughs> you know, the magazines that were on the stands in those pre Rolling Stone days were like sixteen magazine. It was always Beatles right. versus monkeys, Beatles, monkeys versus Beatles. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the issues that they were interested in, like you know, who's cuter, didn't really matter that much to me. But um, <laughs> it it kind of it kind of you know you, the the music uh, you know that what the Beatles were doing was, from my point of view, a lot more serious at that point in 1966, going on 67, than what the Monkees mm. were doing, and yet there was no way to not get 
drawn in by the you know the twanginess of last train to Clarksville and uh -huh. you know and sort yeah. of like against uh, almost as a, a guilty pleasure in a way I remember going yeah. and getting you know more monkeys and uh -huh. uh, and other things and uh you know I, I I kind of liked a lot of it at the time um and over the years have probably blown a little hot and cold but uh you know, generally speaking, I mean, I've got an awful lot of their stuff on my iTunes playlist, and um, you know, and and I too was also really, really pleased with good times. I mean, and and, and particularly, I mean, I think the first thing I heard, which is probably the first thing everybody heard, is "She Makes Me Laugh," and um, oh god, yeah. right, yeah. and that uh -huh. is just such a good song. That light, nice little harmonic twist in the chorus, you know. On she makes me smile, you know, that's just, it's just so beautiful and irresistible. And, you know, I know all of the people who feel that, you know, hip hop has saved music from itself, probably, oy, oy, oy. probably <laughs> don't find very much in this record. And they're saying, oh, you you know, you got, you rockists are into it, you know. But uh, yeah, it's it's a great record in that style. It's very well recorded. It's very well uh -huh. produced. It's got all four voices, which you know is kind of uh, was a surprise. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I I just uh, I I really liked it. I just listened to it again before the show, and uh, I've listened to it a couple of times. And um, yeah, it's great. Fred and I yeah. were talking uh, before uh, about an hour or so ago, and and I was talking about the bonus tracks. There are several. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. uh, bonus uh, tracks out there among various retailers and he and I have both heard them all and they are unlike the bonus tracks on most albums they are exceptional they are yes. very very yeah and mm -hmm. and I am really uh, and I fully expect them to do what Paul McCartney has done and put the whole thing put everything out at some point now i ho certainly hope they do because uh, i hope so the, the one the one i really fred the one i really like is terrifying which i love like, terrifying which i really dreaded hearing when i saw the 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 name but after i heard it i went my god this is fantastic i can't uh, believe that they that you know that it's called terrifying because it's great it is you know? it's great. and i like the fast version of me and magdalena because it reminds yeah, yeah. It, it reminds me a little bit of the two versions of I Want to Be Free. The slow version everybody mm -hmm. knows, yeah. and the faster version that's from the first, uh, from the TV pilot, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I have to say the mix of, or the original mix of Ma me and Magdalena took me a while to get into because I had, I, as, I, as I mentioned in a couple of places, the version I got, because uh, I was reviewing the uh, the MP3s, was a little compressed. But when I heard the um, the video version in the EP EPK, I w it was like it was like uh, opening up a whole new world. It sounds so much better on the CD mm -hmm. and and the and and there, you know, the compressed version does not sound as good to me. But um, I mean, that's yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's great, and I'm re you know, I'm really glad for them. And yeah. and it hit number was it number fourteen? Yes. Now, Billboard. It hit on number Number I, I ended up I just wrote this a couple of days ago number fourteen on Billboard and they they hit the top one hundred artists this week and the Beatles are not there. <laughs> like a, like a They're not selling the Beatles again. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, didn't you know. they say? Didn't they say in nineteen sixty seven? Yes. That they outsold the Beatles uh -huh. and the Rolling and, Stones and the Stones and they still but are. I, I also. <laughs> I also heard combined the Beatles and Stones mm, combined. I don't right. know if that's true. Uh, mm. I think very possibly, I, yeah. I know because so? uh, more, 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 the, more of the Monkeys the first, was the biggest selling album of the year. Right. The first four albums was it? The first four albums hit number one. Oh, they and, all hit uh, number one. They all hit number one. The first four. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I look. I look, I looked that up on the, in my Billboard stats the other day. Oh yeah, and the fifth one, and what was it? Uh, uh, birds, and, birds and bees of the monkeys. Yeah, that was that was number three. What was it? Number three? Or I was going to say number nineteen. Okay. No, no, it was it was number. It would it reached number three, I believe. That was the highest uh, mm -hmm. chart placing. I mean, that was the last time the monkeys uh, albums were in like in the top twenty or something like that. Yeah. Until until now. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, when I first heard uh, She Makes Me Laugh, I had the same reaction as that story. I'm sure you guys know the story about when the Beatles were recording 
Free as a Bird, the Threedles. We're recording uh-huh. Free as a Bird and we're listening to the playback. And Ringo is there. He's listening. And he says, it's the freaking Beatles. You know, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's the way I felt. That's mm-hmm. the way I said, it's the monkeys. You know, when I heard it the first time. And I was so right. thrilled. Although, yeah. I got to tell you, I think Mickey's in better voice now mm-hmm. than he's ever been. He I sounds agree. amazing. Mm-hmm. He does. I think he, I mean, he's been in an amazing voice for a long time. He mm-hmm. does, but right. he seems uh, there's something, you know, having seen him the last couple of years at the fest and then uh, hearing this album, he just sounds fabulous. And, and hey, you know, I mean, we've been doing a fair amount of talking about, you know, about Paul McCartney, who's of a similar age. And uh, Mickey, uh, you know, sounds to me, it seems he seems to sound better than he better than ever. I think that mm-hmm. has a lot to do with Mickey as an actor, because I'm mm-hmm. sure you know that Mickey has done Broadway, of course, and he right. has he, he's had vocal lessons done, proper uh, proper vocal lessons done, so he could do theater, musical theater, and because um, he had the proper training, he's able to use his voice better. And I don't know if Paul, uh, you guys would know this better, did Paul ever do proper vocal training for his voice? No. No. no, that's I probably why. And you can, because, yeah, you can and, tell. Actually, and and, yeah. and and I was had wrote up that thing on Pink Pop last night, and the the video I found of Can't Buy Me Love, he his voice really sounds rough, really strained. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and there were, and I saw some notes last night online that people were there were a lot of comments on on social media about how his voice uh, sounds and. You know, and and uh, but uh, but no, Mickey sounds fantastic. Yeah, mm-hmm. he sounds in better voice on this album than I I, I can remember in many many years. He mm-hmm. just sounds I, he really sounds wonderful. Because uh, last year I saw Mickey do this his a little bit uh, Broadway, a little bit rock and roll show uh, at uh, below fifty four in New York, and mm-hmm. we did a mixture of rock and roll song, monkey songs, mm-hmm. and broad and Broadway tunes, and he was incredible. Um, he was there with a little combo. And uh, he did he did the Broadway songs fantastic, you know that. So I think again I attribute that to him uh, his uh, technique as an actor, doing musical theater to how good his vocals sound. Well, you know right. there are a number of people out there, veterans who who have taken uh, voice lessons late in life, and they've benefited from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know I've actually heard that it, this is hard to believe, but Barbara Streisand. When she was around 60, she was taking voice lessons because she wasn't happy with the sound of her voice, if you can believe that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, yeah. you know, you wow. know there, there are people who, in their 70s, they sound still phenomenal. You uh, know? And, yeah. Uh, didn't Ringo take uh, vocal lessons, too? I think he did. I never heard that. I th- didn't I hear somewhere that... Ringo did. Uh, did I, take you know, some I, I, I think I think you're I think you're right, Fred. I, I think I think there has been some. Alan, does that ring a bell to you? I think it, it does. It does ring a bell. I, I, mm. you know, I, I think simply for the sake of you know mm. preservation and being able to sing um, as much as he sings now, which isn't the whole show, but it's more than he used to sing with the Beatles, which is mm-hmm. one song. So I, I think he did um, see someone. Uh, because when I interviewed him in 89, I was asking him, you know, what are you going to do to avoid what happened with George, you know? Because George wasn't used to going out on tour, and he, and he basically had wrecked his voice, I guess, in the rehearsals, even. Um, mm-hmm. And he was well aware of that. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that he mentioned that he was, you know, seeing like a vocal coach, you know, not serious lessons, but but just to, to know how to, you know, project and preserve his voice. It would be a little surprising if Paul hadn't, you know. I mean, just, you know, everyone's body is different. I mean, sometimes you can keep going yeah. into your 70s, and sometimes it takes a toll. Paul's been out on tour for quite a long time now, between 89 mm. and now. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it it may and, – and he does the whole show, and the whole show is like close to three hours, two and a half, three hours – that's so, right. So, plus a sound check. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm. I mean, I just saw Ringo last week in uh, Bergen Pack, and I thought he was he did a fantastic show. 
and he sounded he sounded great, and he was moving all over that stage and everything. The man is almost like he's almost seventy six, right? Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. And little, month. I know, and he's still going at it. And I said, "God bless him. He's doing fantastic." Mm-hmm. He's still doing yeah. jumping jacks too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Every time I see that, I just kind of go, oh, my God. You know, um, that is he's fantastic. The, he's the Jack LaLanne of the rock and roll world. There you go. All you Ken? Dr- yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you got a question, uh, Ken? Uh, not so much. I just wanted to say that um, my whole experience with the Monkees was that in the 60s, I loved, from the, from the very beginning, the Beatles. <laughs> and in a way, I kind of resisted the Monkees. And my older brother was a Monkees fan, and we used to have fights all the time, <laughs> like brothers do, as to who was the better band. But as I got older, I really began to appreciate the Monkees a lot. And the similarities, obviously, like you were saying, Fred, how many bands can you think of besides the Beatles and the Monkees where it wasn't just about the music? It was also their personalities. Mm-hmm. And all, each of their personalities mm-hmm. were outlined in the TV show. With the Beatles, you had the movies. Right, yeah, exactly. And you had the press conferences, and that was about it. So, you know, that, that played a big part. But overall, I've very often defended the Monkees a lot because I really hate when people debate over whether or not they were a real band. Mm. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah. even though... The Monkees benefited from having, like you said, the cream of the crop, really, real building writers. You can't get better than Carol King and Jerry Goffin and Neil mm-hmm. Diamond and Neil Sedaka and those people. But not only that, they carried themselves so well on the records. I mean, it is them that are singing. Exactly. And, you know, Mickey Dolenz, to me, has always been one of the greatest rock singers of all time who never oh, gets the credit for it. I mm-hmm. totally you know? agree with that. I totally agree with that. And I think uh, the mere mm-hmm. fact that the Monkees are not respected or haven't been respected for so long and there's always that debate as to whether or not they're a real band that people don't take them seriously no matter how talented they are I know. and um, um i don't know if you guys saw the uh recent uh, cbs this morning interview with the three of yes. them mm-hmm. i yes, love sir. when they when they asked uh mike about uh, what how did you uh, uh what do you react when people say you you're not you, you guys aren't real and mike says well define your terms yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in, in a way, it, it, it's partly the the fault of the TV presentation and the publicity around it. I mean, they didn't do very much to dispel the reports that. Well, I mean, it was always said that they didn't play their instruments, and 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 they did, I believe, have studio players um, on some of the early albums. Yeah, the, but, the, but what was never said was right, that the they actually were good. Yeah. yeah. That, that they actually were okay players, you know, and that someone like Mike Nesmith, you know, no one was no one was telling us at the time that, you know, <laughs> this guy actually has done a lot. He's a very accomplished musician. He's a, he's a great songwriter. Um, you know, it was really mm-hmm. sort of well after the Monkees broke up that at least for me that I sort of cottoned on to that. I was like, wait, are you telling me this guy wrote different drum, you know? And uh, you know, they. I think they. And Tork, Tork was Tork was a good musician too. Yeah, I think they could have. Yeah. Um, I think they could have. Tork was a. I, I'm just saying. I, I think they could have maybe um, said a bit more about that. And I have a feeling that later on, when the TV show was petering out and the monkeys were trying to take control of their studio work, and uh, you know, you know, you know all of that. Uh, uh, sort of towards the end of their career, when there were disputes between i guess them and what was it don kirshner um i think they don were kirshner, yeah yeah i think they were trying to establish you know to tell the world you know look we actually are musicians we actually are writers and players um but by then you know that they uh I, I think it should have been done earlier and i i think that um maybe the people doing the publicity for the tv show should have actually made that part of what they were saying part of the message you know, yeah, we put these guys but together, you, well, and, like, and we and we're yeah. having them do a sort of faux Beatles and all that. But it's not like these are just four talentless guys. You know, see what I'm saying? Well, you know, like uh, what, I, what I, I often say is that, that, that when the first records, Michael Nesmith has said that uh, when they saw the credits on the first album, he says, "Where's the credits for all the other musicians on this thing? How come it just shows yeah. us? It, it gives a false impression that we we did all the music on this thing when we didn't." You know, mm. and then it was even worse on more of the monkeys, mm-hmm. where uh, Don Kirshner basically took credit for the whole thing, mm-hmm. 
and thanked all the songwriters and all that. And at the very end, and thanks to the monkeys at the very end of the thing, and uh, the, the monkeys that that second album, one of the monkeys, even though it was the most successful album they put out, uh, mm-hmm. they didn't even know it was coming out. They had to buy a copy, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you know, because they because nobody told them that the second album was out. Nice. And they were furious with that, you know. Uh, and they, that's that, that's where Mickey and Mike Avoy called it the Palace Revolution, where they fought to get the right to perform on their own records. You know, they could have some form of legitimacy, you know, because mm-hmm. they, they, they knew their peers knew what was going on. I mean, the Beatles always liked the Monkees. Uh, the, the Beatles got it, as they used to say. Uh, the, the Beatles got what the whole thing was about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was like everybody else. They said, "Oh, your guys are phony," or all this kind of this, this blah, blah, blah. blah. Uh, and I love. Uh, I'm sure uh, Steve has played this interview of Paul McCartney from 1967 that a fan recorded. Uh, was recording uh, an interview with Paul McCartney and got into the whole thing about the monkeys, how they were copying the Beatles, and Paul defended the monkeys. You know, uh, which I thought was fantastic. Was great. Because he, like, like, like I said, he got it. He knew what it was all, all about. Mm-hmm. Mm. I remember seeing a comment from John Lennon from around that time where he said something to the effect of, hey, you try doing a, a weekly TV show and make records at the same time and mm-hmm. see how right, well I, you do. Mm-hmm. I remember that. I remember that comment. Also, the other one yeah. where he says, uh, the, monkeys, uh, the monkeys aren't like the Beatles at all. They're more like the Marx Brothers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> which you know, which may have something to do with the, the whole respect thing, Alan, that you were talking about, because there's this whole comedy thing that goes on where they do little comedy bits mm-hmm. and you know jokes between each other, and and it almost under uh, you know uh, uh, takes away from some of the seriousness of the music. Out, uh, Fred, do you think you believe you agree with that? Uh yes, to a degree. Um, because the Beatles joked around too. I mean, you can mm-hmm. see some of those videos, especially right. on the the Beatles. One video collection, you see that they're, they're goofing around and joking around on those mm-hmm. things, and and that's sort of uh, that's a sort of precursor to what the monkeys were going to be doing later on. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the whole thing with Hard Day's Night is you know, you, uh, again, it was uh, you could see elements of the monkeys is in Hard Day's Night and Help, especially Help. I think I think Help was probably more influential towards the TV show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, uh, and the humor helped the Beatles a lot, and uh, I think the humor helped the Monkees a lot as well. So because um, I, I, I look at it the case like look at the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones were not a humorous band. No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. No. No. Uh, no, no, no. Well, well, the Beatles and the Monkees. Uh, it was a much more. There was they were much more endearing. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Uh, because yeah. of the humor. Because of the comedy, you know, because you had that element, you had both a comedy act and a music act going on in the cases of both groups. Well, okay. for me, for me, um, you know, what I've often said is that as much as I love the music and I think that what they created, you know, in the 60s there, the monkeys, um, that music gets stronger through time for me. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're just great songs and they were executed well. But mm-hmm. the story of the monkeys itself is just as compelling as the music. Right. And, uh, yeah. You know, the whole idea of the fact that these were four guys that really had musical backgrounds to begin with. And they really weren't hired to be musicians. Right. They were hired to be actors. No. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But this, here's the thing about that. Uh, and this has been coming out more recently that when they did the uh, auditions for the monkeys originally, uh, if you look at the ads, the requirement is that you had to play music, too. You know, you just can't go there and just do like a, a actor's audition. You have to be able to play a musical instrument. So it wasn't that they hired four actors and then made them made them pretend to play music. They hired four actors who could play music. You know, and right. uh, Davy right. Davy could play guitar, and he let, and he actually was a. Uh, he actually was a good, pretty good percussionist because in concert, in the Monkees concerts, when Mickey did his solo turn, Davey would go up on stage and take over for Mickey on drums, hmm. you know, in mid-beat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, all you got to do is look at the Monkees on Tour episode, and you can see it happen. Uh-huh. So, um, 
So yeah, they were all talented musically. I mean, Davey did have the Broadway background, so he had that musical theater background. So yeah, technically he was a musician because of that. Sure. Uh, and uh, the, Peter came out of the uh, Greenwich Village uh, folk scene, and Mike Nesbitt mm -hmm. came out of the Los Angeles uh, Hollywood Boulevard scene, and Mickey as mm -hmm. well. So they all had musical talent. You know, I, I don't, anybody who keeps saying, well, they don't have any, they don't, they, they never uh, paid their dues. They, they did pay their dues. They did pay mm -hmm. their dues. You yeah, know, Mickey, Mickey, uh, Mickey had, uh, I mean, uh, everybody, I think Mike's uh, his prehistory is not, um, but Mickey was also in some uh, in a couple of early bands before the Monkees. He wasn't mm -hmm. just yes. an actor. Mm -hmm. that, that's an you know that's a point to be made. And Davey, of course, uh, you know uh, was uh, was in theater, and uh, you know, and of course Oliver, uh, um, you know, the night that the the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan Show. So right, right. Um, mm -hmm. They and Peter, of course, Peter was a mu musician. Period. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because he came out of Greenwich Village. Exactly. But, I mean, uh, Peter hang, hung around with people like uh, John Sebastian and uh, Stephen Stills and uh, Mama Cass and those and Dylan and all those guys. Uh, and, and Peter played on the stage with Pete Seeger at Carnegie Hall during a folk uh, concert. Hmm. You know, so it is before the Monkees that Peter was on stage <laughs> with Pete Seeger. So I you know, that's that. You know, the man uh, Peter uh, of the four of them was the most musically talented. I mean, he studied okay. music, so right. it was it was very frustrating for him when the monkey started to go in the studio, ready to play guitar, and they look at him and say, "What are you doing with that thing? The record's done." Mm. You know mm -hmm. that he he felt humiliated by that because he's he, he's a trained musician, knows his craft, and yet they're telling him, "The record's done. Go away." You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that broke his heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Fred, I wanted to ask you this because we're talking about the the monkeys as musicians here. How was it decided? I mean, obviously, they sang on the records. Yes. You know, the producers thought enough of them to let them sing the lead vocals. How was it decided, well, you can do the lead vocals, but we're not going to let you play guitar I, or whatever? Where did they draw the line there? I think what they did, they did, like, uh, once they picked the four guys that were going to be the monkeys, they, they decided who's going to be the lead singer on the thing. So they did, like, demos and things with them or t test recordings to determine who had the better voice. And it was determined that of the four of them, Mickey had the best voice for rock and roll and pop. Mm -hmm. uh, Davey was, had a good voice, uh, you know, because of his Broadway, Broadway training. And he could do like the, uh, the ballads and things like that. But he was mm -hmm. good. He could sing the more up uh, tempo songs too. Mike, his voice was not so much suited for pop, but it was suited for more, more rock and roll and for uh, country music. Mm. So that if you notice the first songs on Monkey Songs with Mike singing lead, his his songs have more country feel to them. Mm. Uh, Papa and then Jean's Peter, Blues. Papa Jean's Blues, and Peter yeah. he was a folky, so um, so his voice you know was uh, not suited so much for pop, but it was suited for a more folk sound. So if you listen to the recordings of Peter uh, from that period. Uh, is even some of the outtakes that show up on some of the as bonus cuts on some of the Monkey albums, uh, you can hear the folk influence of Peter in those in those songs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like um, uh, for Pete's sake, uh, the the song that was the closing song for the second season uh, of the of the of the TV show, uh, where you heard right. the closing closing credits. Uh, Peter wrote that song. And you sort of, you know, get the folk message in that of peace and love, in that, mm. in that, in that song. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Al. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in kind of uh, related to that, Fred has been involved with the Monkees, uh, certainly in New York, for a, a very long time. And this is some years ago, and uh, I forget who told me this story, but our mutual friend Charles Rosenay. Mm -hmm. uh, put on a uh, several years ago. Put on kind of a mm, general rock and roll pop culture convention, and Peter was one of the guests. Yes, and and they did a uh, they did you know the usual you know Q and A, 
And of course, some jerk has to get up and ask, you know, oh, oh, the monkeys didn't play their instruments on their own records. And of course, Peter's been uh, asked this about, you know, eight million times. Right. Mm-hmm. And and he he kind of sighs, and he looks over at Fred, and he says, "Hey, Fred, you want to take this one?" And Fred, <laughs> yeah, I remember and, that. <laughs> and Fred kind of passed, and it turned out that Elaine McFarlane, you know, Spanky from Spanky and Our Gang, mm-hmm. was there, and she said, "Yeah, they're studio musicians. We use them too." Right. That's the thing that always gets me about that whole. Oh, the monkeys didn't play their own instruments. Well, right. uh, when you think about it, neither the Beach Boys. <laughs> yeah. Neither did Mamas mm-hmm. and the Papas. Mm-hmm. Neither did Simon uh, and Garfunkel. Gar- Garfunkel, mm-hmm. the birds in the first records. Mm-hmm. All right. right. You know, because uh, all you got to do is see the movie, The Wrecking Crew, and the book about The Wrecking Crew. Exactly. It tells you the whole story, you know, you know uh, that everybody used studio musicians at the time. It was an industry standard. It was a standard practice. In the music right. industry, so um, to singled out the monkeys, I always thought was unfair, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because the same musicians that played in the monkey records also played on pet sounds, you know. Yes, right, exactly, right, yeah. So, what do you, uh, 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 Fred? Give me, give for people who aren't really familiar with the the musical progression of the monkeys, give kind of a. a, a a concise view of how they develop from the first album through, well, through now, actually. But, I mean, you know, basically, the, the albums before Good Times, how did they, how did they, what was the progression? Well, the, the because first they two. Did, they, like the Beatles, they did progress. They that's, did. That's a, that's a, a, a definite parallel with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, the first two albums were definitely, the uh, the Don Kirshner period, where it was uh, the uh, the songwriters and the Wrecking Crew studio musicians used, and um, and they uh, Boyce, uh, Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart who wrote Last Train to Clarksville and a lot of their other songs like I Want to Be Free and Valerie, mm-hmm. uh, who deserve a lot of credit because they helped develop the Monkey Sound because they were actually the first producers of the early Monkey records. And mm-hmm. they de- they developed the sound of what the monkey should sound like, and then Don Kirshner, when he got involved in the project, because he wasn't signed to the project yet, uh, Boyce and Hart were doing the records first, and they thought they were going to be the the producers, and then Don Kirshner was hired because he had the stable of songwriters, so he was hired to do the musical supervision on it. So Boyce and Hart was out, were out as producers, but then Boy- uh, Don Kirshner tried to get people like Mickey Most. And uh, producers like that to, re- to produce the Monkey Records, and it didn't sound right. You know, they didn't get that sound, and they called back Boyce and Hart to help develop the sound. So, like I said, Boyce and Hart deserve a lot of the credit for those early records. And Michael Nesmith, uh, he was able, he was able to push his songs enough to get two of his songs on the first two albums. You know, he had two songs in the first album and two songs in the second album, uh, and. Um, his songs on the first albums sound don't sound anything like the rest of the record. If you yeah. know, you know, uh, you just have to listen to Nesmith's stuff on the first album. It says this is something other, you know, mm-hmm. something. Uh, this is not. This is not Last Train to Clarksville. This is something totally something else. And so they had um, when they had the big brouhaha with uh, with Don Kirshner, the the, the Palace Rebellion, uh, where. They made an ultimatum that, well, if you know the whole story, Kirshner was taking credit for a lot of the uh, the music and all that for the songs becoming hits. And this not only irked the monkeys, it irked the producers who were Bob Rafelson and Bert Schneiders, the guys who created uh, the, con- the, the concept and the, the series and everything. And they said, uh, he seems to be overstepping his bounds here. You know? And it really hit the fan when uh, the, the powers that be said for the next monkey single, which is going to be a little bit me, a little bit you, the B side has to have the boys uh, playing their own music on their own song. And the song was going to be The Girl I Knew Somewhere, written by Mike Nesmith. So Kirshner, uh, who was a control freak, basically, uh, didn't want to give that up that control. So he released the single A Little Bit Me, A Little Bit You 
prior to the release date in Canada. And the B-side was uh, an early version of She Hangs Out with Davey doing the vocals. It was a totally different arrangement. Mm -hmm. And that sort of like uh, said, okay, you know, you, you just broach, you just reached the contract, kid. And, uh, and Kirsten was sued. <laughs> He was sued, and he and they and they bought him off. You know, he was fired from the project, and the Monkeys were not only allowed to put to record the next single, the, the B side for the next single, but to go on to record the music for their third album, which would become Headquarters. And Mike Nesmith went out and uh, got Chip Douglas, uh, who worked with the Turtles, to produce mm -hmm. the record. And Chip didn't really have that much experience producing a record, but Mike Nesmith said, "Don't worry, I'll show you what to do." And uh, and Mike, from the very beginning, he was the one who was like guiding the monkeys into what he his vision of what the monkeys should be, and you could hear that in the headquarters album. You could the jangly guitars mm. and the direction of the songs were more introspective and much more creative. You listen to a song like uh, uh, Shades of Grey, you know, mm. totally mm. different from anything yeah. from the first two albums, right. you know. And um, and Mickey got to shine in particular with Randy Scout's Git, you know his first mm -hmm. his first songwriting credit as a monkey, you know which was uh, if you know the story behind that that was when the Monkeys did their first tour of England in 1967 and they were invited by the Beatles to a party you know the Beatles threw a party for the Monkeys and right. uh, the song is basically a di Mickey's diary of all the events uh, regarding the party where he met his first wife. Samantha Just, uh, Mama Cass is in the song somewhere, <laughs> and the Beatles are referred to as the Four Kings of EMI. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, from there you you got you got the creative leap. You know, it's uh, from the first two albums to Headquarters, which is a a, a huge chasm of a leap. You know, to go mm -hmm. from one to the other, and then you go to the next album. Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones, and that's why, ooh, we're hitting Sgt. Pepper's material uh, territory now, you know, because um, that again was produced by Chip Douglas, and again you had these amazing songs, and the guys were on fire on that. Now, did, here's the difference between Headquarters and Pisces, in that while Pisces uh, Headquarters was mostly the, the Monkees playing with some studio musicians here and there, Pisces was a mixture of the two where the monkeys were playing some of the music on it, but they still had studio musicians uh, augmenting everything else. So Mickey's not playing drums on all the songs on the uh, album, but he's, uh, he's on there. But again, you, you, you got Mickey also expressing his creativity with using the Moog synthesizer on some of the songs. Mm -hmm. And Mickey, mm -hmm. I think, had, I think Pisces is the first... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Alan Cozen will probably know this better than anybody. No, <laughs> uh, okay, but uh, the Pisces is probably the first pop album to use a Moog uh, on a, on pop songs. I think. I mean, yeah, I think I, what I don't I don't know of any any. I mean, I think one. the door. I think well, the door. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Brian may my Brian Wilson may may have done it first. Um, that's just a guess though. Well, well, he used, the, he used the theremin on good yeah, vibrations, the, but no. right. Oh, so, I think the Doors use uh, a Moog also, but I'm not sure where that sits in the chronology. I think, of, I think it's a little later. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the Monkees, I think, were the first group pop mm. band to use a Moog on a pop record, mm -hmm. uh, and it shows in songs like "Daily Nightly," in mm -hmm. uh, "Love Is Only Sleeping," in "Star Collector." Mm -hmm. uh, you're hearing these weird sounds that gel in there and it just works you know they did they did daily nightly during the um the tour with nesmith was it last year or the year before uh, oh god 2013 just, yeah that was that was just amazing to see them do that in concert that was that was absolutely wonderful and have you ever seen the videos of that that's hysterical because mm -hmm. uh, oh the but, original videos yeah the videos because uh mm -hmm. mickey's saying that mike found a moog for us and then Mike says, "Well, I didn't find a Moog, oh, but, right, I a, right. but I found a picture of one." And they they showed mm -hmm. it on the screen. And then Mike said, "Don't worry, we'll get the sounds right." And as Mickey singing mm -hmm. the song, Mike is doing the Moog sounds with his mouth, you know, <laughs> right? Vocally, right? And it's hysterical. You got to, you know, you, you go on YouTube, you'll find them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, okay, well, we got we got to Pisces, so they got a mixture of the 
the studio musicians and the monkeys themselves. And plus, uh, remember, Pisces also introduced Harry Nielsen into yes. the mix. You got with Cuddly yeah. Toy, you mm -hmm. know. So again, and uh, Michael Murphy's on that too, mm -hmm. uh, with the song uh, "Why Am I Doing Hanging Round." So you had you had you still had some really great writers, and Carol King and Jerry Goffin with Pre Pleasant Valley Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, which is considered which is considered perhaps their best single, you know. So you still have that mix of creativity, and then you get into the next album, the fifth album, uh, "Birds and Bees and Monkeys," which is sort of like a hybrid. Uh, again, which is more, uh, some tracks are, they're on it, and some tracks, again, are mostly the studio musicians. But then you get into more weirder stuff, especially with Nesmith. You know, with, with songs like Tapioca Tundra, Auntie's Municipal Court, uh, Writing Wrongs, and Magnolia Sims. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the whole mm -hmm. gamut. Uh, it's all spread out there. It's more of a, uh, the, uh, that album is more of a hodgepodge. It's more like a, a mixed bag. So it's not it's probably not as cohesive as headquarters or Pisces, but it has its mm -hmm. little charms here and there. It has little gems are in there. And now shall we plow into head? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well I was just gonna yeah. I was just gonna say head, head's, a, head's a different animal altogether. Let's talk about the movie first. Give me your straight out opinion of the movie. I personally love the album. I mean excuse me, not the I, well, I like the album too, but I personally like the uh, the movie. Because I think, in my opinion, it's probably the most artistically creative thing they ever did. You know, I know okay. commercially it was not a hit. You know, uh, it was a, you know, it's not what you would think a monkey movie would be. But it was a, it, it was more the view of the director, Bob Rafelson, his commentary on commercialism and the, the battle of commercialism and uh, corporatism against the creativity of the individual, I think, because... Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they, they, well, I was going to say, they basically tried to destroy their, their image. They really wanted to tear it down, and they, they wanted to, you know, break out of the, you know, the like the Beatles wanted to break out of the Fab Four, you know, the Fab Four image, the, the monkeys wanted to break away from the little television group and, and you know, become individuals and get a little more respect. And, it's, and in some respects back then, I don't think that people understood it, but I think it's it's a lot more appreciated now, a lot. More. It, it uh, is, it is. I think, uh, I mean, you had uh, Jack Nicholson involved in their right. uh, all four monkeys, even though they're not credited per se, they had a hand in writing the script. And uh, Jack Nicholson was the super the album supervisor of the of the soundtrack album. So mm -hmm. uh, so that's a whole different animal right there. But the movie uh, and the album both, in my opinion, have the best songs that the monkeys ever recorded. Uh, hmm. A group a group of the best songs they ever recorded. Uh, all those mm. all those songs are amazing. As uh, we go along, Porpoise yeah. Song, yeah. Circle. I love Sky, I love Por Porpoise Porpus Song is one of my favorite monkey songs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, song I love is, that song to death. That's my I mean, favorite ahead. monkey song. The first time I heard, really? yep. the first time I heard Porpoise Song, I said, "This is like Walrus," you know. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah. like Wal it's just like Walrus. Uh -huh. uh, and then Daddy's song again, written by uh, Harry Nielsen, which I think was. Probably Davy's best performance on film, you know, mm -hmm. bar none. I'll tell you a little story. The year that Davy died, a few mm -hmm. months later, uh, my friend Eric Lefkowitz, who wrote another, who wrote another right. one of the best, mm -hmm. another sure. great monkeys yeah. book, uh, mm -hmm. the monkeys, mm -hmm. monkeys tale and monkey business. Yep. He invited me to the screening of Head, which included uh, on the panel uh, Kurt Loder from MTV and Rolling Stone. Mm. You know, I was in the audience, but I was able to to uh, ask questions and stuff. But uh, when they played the movie and they got to Daddy's song, uh, everybody was enjoying the movie. They were having a good time. But when they got to Daddy's song, everybody was quiet. You know, everybody, mm -hmm. the, the whole room was quiet, and we're just staring at the screen because Davy had just passed a few months uh -huh. before. And when he gets, to, and then when the the part of the song in the movie where it just stops, and Davy just sings a cappella. The years have passed, and so have I. Huh. I don't think. I don't oh, know. I, wow. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. I'll, I'll bet. Oh my oh. gosh. <laughs> oh my. Oh man. And then after the after the sequence was finished, the whole place exploded with applause. You know, because we just because wow. because we had just lost Davy, and then we just had that scene, and we just it just it just hit home. 
even more at that that moment, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was that was, in, you know, I, I I still think about that moment every time. Oh you know? sure, I'll yeah. bet. Yeah. And they there were some great people in that movie. Zappa was in it. Is it Frank and Zappa. And that and that Cello. was in it. I mean, yeah. there were there was uh, Tim Buckley. I mean, there were some wonderful people. No, no, no not not movie. not Tim Buckley. Not Tim Buckley. Tim Buckley appeared in the last episode of the TV series. Yes. Oh, okay. But okay. if you if you blink, you will miss uh, Jack Nicholson and Dennis Hopper in the movie. Right. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Anybody want to where... comment on that? And Sonny Liston, who we talked about last and Sonny, week. And Sonny, <laughs> and, Sonny, and Sonny Liston and Ray Nitschke, you know, Nitschke, and Right. Ray, and Carol Dota, who just passed away about a year or so ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, carry on, gentlemen. I, I think of those those two songs that Al mentioned, both written by uh, Carol King and Jerry Goffin, shows how great, what a songwriting yeah. team to be able to expand into something so entirely different, really into psychedelia for them. Oh, yeah. With, with the purpose song and As We Go Along, and which I, I was give, so happy in recent years Mickey's been doing live. You know, mm-hmm. so. And I got to give credit to Peter Tork. I think he wrote two of the best songs here recorded with the monkeys uh can you dig it and do i have yeah. to do this all over again mm-hmm. and uh for those who check liner notes and in, in the cd booklets whatever be aware that uh as we go along has uh neil young playing guitar on that mm-hmm. really Ooh. yes yes and i never uh, knew that and steven stills is playing on uh do i have to do this all over again huh. wow wow so for all those people out there that said the monkeys the monkeys don't didn't have any credibility. I say, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, fact they, the fact they had Zappa in the in the movie, I mean, that was that was credibility. By the way, also in also in head was was Victor Mature, Terry Gar, and and uh, uh, oh, you some oh, I think Al, you mentioned Carol Dota. So Carol Dota, but, uh, also uh, uh, Tony Basil. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Tony Basil. Yeah, I mean that, Tony that was it was Tony Basil because she's doing yeah, the dancing it, sequence with Davy. And Daddy's song, of course, she came out years later with the song Mickey. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey, Number one record. And that, con- yeah. that concert sequence, uh, you know, where the group plays live is, is absolutely wonderful, you know. It is. It's there. probably, um, someone once said it's probably one of the best filmed concert, rock and roll concert sequences ever, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that's a great uh, that's a great song. Uh, Circle Sky is such a great song. I'm glad uh, that they they did that uh, when uh, Mike toured with them, and it was gr- it was great to, to oh, yes. hear that because it's <coughs> yes. such a great song. Do a real thing, quick thing about the reunions, Fred. Okay, well let me just briefly about the other three albums. Instant Replay has some really good songs, and it. it's a mixture of earlier songs with newer songs. And one mm-hmm. of my favorite Monkey songs is on that album, Instant Replay. It's uh, While I Cry by uh, Nesmith. Mm-hmm. I think it has okay. fantastic guitars and beautiful vocal harmonies. Uh, Monkeys Presents was a project that was originally going to be the four of them. It was going to be a double record set with each side having dedicated to each monkey. Didn't happen when Peter quit and they condensed the, the concept to one album where the, they had an equal number of songs on the uh, album. And that album contains Listen to the Band and mm-hmm. a couple of songs that Davey wrote and some that uh, Mickey wrote, which are all good. A uh, French song, which Davey co-wrote with, I, well, no, Bill Chadwick wrote that song. Yeah, it, I think it's one of the best songs, performances that Davey ever did with the Monkees, in my opinion. And then we go to the last album, Changes, which Mike had quit, Peter had quit previously. And that was going back to the concept of the first two albums, where they were just the singers and the songs were provided for them. And uh, it's a good pop album. It's a good pop album. Um, there are some good songs on it. Mickey's Midnight Train, I think, is a standout. And the uh, the last song on the album is a Voice and Heart song. I never thought it peculiar, which was a good showcase for Davey. So you know, it's it's it has it's it has its good good and bad moments, but it's not the worst album they ever did. Uh, so mm-hmm. so now moving ahead. Reunion years. Let me let me ask a quick let me ask a quick thing about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because that's a big issue. Yes. For, I, I mean I know how you feel about it, but mm. I'm starting to think and and guys, uh, please weigh in. Uh, I'm starting to think that this album, the Good Times album, may help that cause a lot um, because number one, they got a good re- a really good review from Rolling Stone, which really surprised me. 
Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's been it's been pra- it's been praised by a lot of the critics. It's it's selling well, which on its own doesn't necessarily mean anything. But I think that they are on the verge of getting a lot more respect, and uh, and maybe we'll get surprised, and maybe they will get nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall. Well, I'm uh, I'm both shocked and stunned. <laughs> no, <laughs> but no, I seriously, I am thrilled with all the positive press that the monkeys are getting for this album for good times and for the uh, 50th anniversary tour, uh, especially for Rolling Stone, which was, I was totally uh, shocked by because uh, of all the bad press. I mean, Mickey used to call them Rolling Stain. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You know, I've, I've, I I think I've, I think I asked uh, at least Peter and, and Mickey about, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they both, you know, they both said, uh, you know, they both kind of didn't get real, uh, you know, strong about it. But you could tell they would really love it, and yeah. and it's just too bad Davy's not around. Well, Davy, but- I think uh, Davy did an interview on a few years ago, which he was asked about Rock and Hall of Fame, and he felt, yeah, they we do deserve to be in there. You know, it would be nice if we yeah, could be in there. I think that's one. Of, I think he told me that too when I talked to the one of the two times I talked to him. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, and yeah. And, and I to, uh, since we're plugging books, by the way, I hate to mention it, but I also I have a yes. my, I have one book and it's a monkey's book. Yeah, it's called Eat a Monkey, Davy Jones. It's a condensation of my two interviews with Davy Jones, um, and one of them actually has a lot of Beatles content because he talks mm-hmm. about the night that the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan Show, and he talks about. The, he, he was quoted at one point as, as saying the Beatles were manufactured, and I got a hold of him to counter that, and he countered that. So that's basically, and that's available through Amazon and and all the usual places. No, can so, but uh, anyway, selling, yeah. selling uh, right next, selling right next to my book, right. selling right, <laughs> to your book, selling right next to your book, yeah. Fred. But yeah, Fred. Fred, let me ask you a question that might tie the you know the kind of the reunion albums all together. What is it about Good Times that seems to work so much better than either Justice or Pool It did? I think what it is is that Pool It and Justice, now going to Pool It, I think because it's a product of the 80s, you know, mm-hmm. you could, the, the 80s production mm-hmm. just permeates that album. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, there are some good songs on it. Heart and Soul, I think, is a great single. But uh, I think they were trying too hard to compete with uh, what the pop scene was at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they had uh, Roger Bertrand. I can't remember the name, but uh, he, he produced uh, Squeeze and people like that. And it's, it was a matter of uh, they, they chose songs that would have been great for uh, an 80s pop act, but were not necessarily good for the monkeys. You know, a Davy, I think, said, "We're oh, on this album. You're not going to hear those jangly guitars." <laughs> well, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's, I, I like Peter's songs on that album because I thought he, he should. Well, the, the song he did, "Getting In," uh, had a bit of creativity in there. It almost sounded like a, it reminded me of a Prince song, mm-hmm. you know, in a way. And Davy's ballads were good, uh, but overall, it had too much of an '80s sheen, and it because of that, I think it dates more. And even the mm-hmm. original Monkey albums from the 60s, you know, uh, Just Us, the concept was good, whereas it was produced by the Monkeys, the songs were written by the Monkeys, and all the music is by the Monkeys. I think that was good. Uh, the problem was that it was produced in the 90s, and what we have in the 90s, we had the grunge thing going on. And mm-hmm. I think they were trying too hard, again, to reach a certain audience. It doesn't help also that Mike, of all the vocals that Mike did on that album, it was a remake of Circle Sky. Yeah. You know, and I always felt that that album needed a Nesmith ballad. If you listen to, like, Michael Nesmith's solo albums, Mm -hmm. uh, especially, like, from Infinite Rider and uh, Tropical Campfires, Mm -hmm. there's some beautiful Mike Nesmith ballads on that. That's what Just Us needed. It needed a Mike Nesmith ballad. Yeah. You know, it, it had a very rough, angry edge to it. I think that's that was. I think that's what was one of the problems with Just Us. It was too angry. You know, it was it was an angry record. I um, actually liked it a lot. Oh, I like it too. I think there's some good songs, but it was there's an element of anger in that album. You know, mm. um, and I think because it doesn't sound like a 
a classic monkeys album in um so but and that's where we get to good times good times sounds like a classic monkeys album mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh i think that's what they were aiming for that's what andrew sandoval was aiming for that's what uh, uh who's the producer it's um yeah adam Schlesinger. Adam. yes uh from fountains of wayne that's what they were right. aiming for they wanted the they wanted to sound like a classic monkeys album from the 1960s they wanted to, like the songs they those songs could have been on pisces some of those songs could have been on mm-hmm. pisces if they, you know mm-hmm. yeah so um and i think it's brilliant you know what they did um yeah it, it is it is to get and the since guys you, since, you, since you mentioned andrew sandoval let's a toast to Andrew Sandoval. For oh yes, yeah. Oh, very a lot of credit. So, Andrew, if you're listening, uh, you're fan- you're 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 the man. You're fantastic. You're, you're the guy. I, I I bow to Andrew Sandoval as a monkey expert. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I bow to him. He's a bad I, I, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> uh, sure, sure you are, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Um, to have people like um, Rivers Cuomo from Weezer, and to have like Noel Gallagher and uh, Paul Weller and the the guys Andy from Partridge. Uh, Andy yep. Partridge, to write songs for them, I thought, wow, you know, it's a, it's amazing, and it shows how yeah, much respect, and- how much respect a lot of today's composers uh, in rock and roll and pop have for the Monkees today. Mm-hmm. You know that says a lot right there that they want they wanted to be part of this project. You know, right. uh, that's incredible. And then to have quality songs from the monkeys themselves writing. You know, uh, right. the, the song uh, "I Know What I Know" by Michael Nesbitt. It's, it's a great song. Now he mm-hmm. he he recorded solo previously, and the solo version has more orchestration on it. But this version that's on Good Times is simple. It's a much more simpler arrangement. It's 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 uh, almost uh, would you say more acoustic or or um, yeah or, 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 or stripped or stripped down. That's what I think that's the word I'm looking for. It's more stripped yeah. down version, and yeah. it adds. It's more exactly that's the word I'm looking for. Intimate. It it gives a more intimacy to the song and the lyrics, and Nesbitt's performance on that is just amazing. Mm-hmm. And then there's the song that Noel Gallagher and Paul Weller wrote, "Birth of an Accidental Hipster." That's yeah, like right. that one I like a lot. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. like Tapioca Tundra Junior. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like a mixture of Tapioca Tundra and Writing Wrongs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Mickey's uh, Middle Eight in that song is great. So um, I just have a lot of praise for this album. And then you mentioned Steve the bon- the, the the bonus cuts. Right. The, the, the two that could be found on the iTunes and the other ones that could spread around like on F F Y E. And on the Japanese CD and the upcoming Barnes and Noble uh, vinyl, mm-hmm. those those bonus cuts are good too. And yeah, I agree. They should have been on the album. And I think you're right. He's, they're going to pull a McCartney and release a deluxe deluxe edition later on with yeah. uh, those songs I've, uh, on there. Yeah, I've I've tried to, to I've asked and nobody's saying anything, which which in, in generally means something's being considered. So I hope <laughs> I hope. Uh, I hope they do do that. I hope this is my. Anybody, else, anybody want to ma- uh, make any final comments before we sign off? Because I know we're getting close. Uh, definitely, Captain. I think you bring the summer. You bring the summer is such an excellent yes. pop song. Mm-hmm. I mean, give the credit there to Andy Partridge for sure. for writing that one. It's it mm-hmm. belongs like it could have been a, six, a single in 1966. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And Mike Nesbitt is so proud of his baby deep voice in that song. Mm-hmm. When, when you hear the ba- that little baby coming up, that's Mike Nesmith doing that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, anyway, Fred, um, this has been incredible. Uh, we got to thank you uh, a whole lot. I'm humbled that you guys asked me to be on tonight. I'm really thrilled, and I appreciate you guys asking me to be on tonight. Oh, it's our pleasure. Oh, you're, you're <laughs> our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you for. Thank you for coming in and on short notice too. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate that. Oh, so um, anytime well, yeah. you want, anytime you want to bring Mickey over on the show. Yeah, you know, I was uh, just going to say. Peter, I was just going to say if Mickey you know, is Mike, listening, Mike's we'd welcome. love to have you. Well, that's Peter like Mike. Or Mike, Mike. Well, remember that Mike did Skype the New York concert. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Andrew. Uh, 
any any uh you know uh, we'll be glad to it, we'll, we'll do this again we'd love to do it again yeah so. well mike mike um, wanted to be on mike wanted to be on but he's on hold right now i have to tell him to come back later <laughs> 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 All right. Um, for anybody that wants to get a hold of us, uh, you can you can uh, write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. Um, we have a Facebook page. We have a Facebook uh, group page. We have a Facebook radio page. And so, uh, anytime you, you know, we'd love to hear what you think about this show or any other show that we've done. Um, you can hear our shows on podbean.com and on YouTube. Uh, there's uh, We have a channel on YouTube, uh, Things We Said Today, where um, most of our most of our shows, not all, but most of them are, are uploaded where you can stream them uh, without having to download them if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. Anybody, uh, uh, anybody got anything to say before we uh, call it quits? Well, on my website, just want to make a quick mention that since I have trivia every single week where you can win one of nine prizes... A new prize is called Pure McCartney. It's uh, the two-CD set from Paul spanning his entire career. So if you want to win that, you can go to my website on the trivia page and uh, enter to win. KenMichaelsRadio.com Okay. All right. And I'm also, as of this writing, uh, by the time this goes up, I'm giving away five copies of that two-CD set. Um, If you look through my review of pure mccartney on the mccartney examiner page uh, the details are at the bottom and that contest ends on the 17th on uh, june 17th so if you're hearing this before june 17th catch my review of pure mccartney on uh, paul mccartney examiner and the details are at the bottom of the story on how to enter so um i think that's it fred again thank you very much yeah well, say well, hello thank to, you guys. Say thank hello you, to mickey, and, mickey and uh peter and michael if you uh, if you see them i'll give them their uh, regard i'll give you i'll give okay. i'll give you your i'll give them your regards guys <laughs> and can i um, can i give my little plug too please go ahead uh, okay please. well all right folks uh you can get my book a little bit me a little bit you uh, the monkeys from a fan's perspective, you can get it on Amazon, on Apple iBooks, uh, Barnes & Noble Nook, uh, Smashwords, CreateSpace, and uh, I'm sure you can order it at some of your uh, record stores. I mean, not record, bookstores, excuse me. Uh, also, if you would like to get a signed copy of my book, you could find me on, uh, on my Facebook page. Just look up Fred Velez, you'll find me. And just send me a private message, and we'll make up, work out the particulars, and we'll get a... Uh, signed copy to you and also i'm a writer for the monkeys.net i have a blog there so you can find my my blog uh, uh my blog uh, articles there as well and you did not mention i am surprised that the the uh, zilch the excellent oh monkeys yes. podcast zilch which is which i i've heard some some episodes of that and uh, Zilch people, if you're listening, I would love to talk to you for Monkey's Examiner. I've sent them notes, so uh, yeah. I would love yeah. to, would love to, love to do a story about that because I it is it's a great it's a great little podcast. Yes, I, I, one, as far as I know, it's the only one for the monkeys. Nobody, there's no others. I mean, right. there's several Beatles uh, ones, but there, I don't think there's another one for the monkeys. Yes, yeah, so that's they, uh, uh, that's Ken Mills and Melly Mitchell and Sarah Clark who do it, and they do a fantastic job. I've been on that show on that podcast several times. So definitely, folks, check out the Zilch podcast if you want to hear all things monkeys. Uh, there have been some great updates on uh, the tour and the album. So definitely uh, check it out. Okay. Zilch. And uh, Zilch. I will give my 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 personal email address, beetlesexaminer at gmail.com. I know we're running short of time. Um, Al, Al or Alan, do you have anything to say before we go? Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'll give one last plug for my for my book, uh, uh, Meet a Monkey. Davy Jones is on Amazon and and uh, Barnes and Noble and just about everywhere else. Anyway, thanks for listening. This has been a great show, and we hope you will be with us uh, next week uh, at, at all the usual places. And until then, this is Steve Marinucci for Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, and Alan Cosen and Fred Velez saying thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye.